The Sultanate of Women Qasim and Turhan Through most of history, queens have been kept out of power politics. Their jobs were to produce sons who might one day rule, daughters who could be traded in dynastic marriages, and to leave the ruling up to their husbands. Of course, traditional gender roles never stopped clever and ambitious women from claiming power where and when they could. Things were the same in the Ottoman Empire, where the Sultan kept a harem of hundreds of enslaved concubines, captured from all over the empire to bear his children. But from 1533 to 1656, a handful of remarkable women bent the harem system to their wills and exercised extraordinary political influence and power. This period is known as the Sultanate of Women. Let's meet the women who rose from sexual slavery to rule the Ottoman Empire. In previous videos, we met Horem Sultan, who so captivated Suleiman the Magnificent that she carved an unprecedented role as empress and advisor. And Nurbanu Sultan, who took over that role and expanded it as queen mother. Safiya Sultan and Handan Sultan took their turns as queen of the harem, but none could match the power and influence attained by the lady we'll meet today, Qasim Sultan. She was born Anastasia, the daughter of a priest on the Greek island of Tinos. At 15, she was stolen from her home and brought to Istanbul, where she was presented to the 14-year-old Sultan, Ahmed I. At such a young age, the new Sultan was in over his head, and his mother, Handan, who had been trying her best to guide and advise him, had recently died. Ahmed admired his new concubine's beauty and lovely singing voice but he was also struck by her intelligence and tenacity. He gave her the Turkish name Qasem, meaning leader of the herd. As her name suggests, Qasem was a political natural. With Ahmed's grandmother and mother out of the way, the young concubine easily maneuvered herself to take charge in and outside of the harem. Her admiring sultan named her Hatseke Sultan, chief consort, and she bore him five sons and four daughters. So many sons born to a single concubine was unusual, and they enhanced her power, as did her daughters, whose marriages she had the right to arrange. She granted their hands to important statesmen whose loyalty she wished to ensure. One of her daughters, Aisha, was divorced and remarried to seven different grooms to suit her mother's ambitions. Qasim was determined that her own eldest son, Murad, should succeed his father as sultan. But he was not his father's eldest son. Ahmed had two older sons by other concubines, and the eldest was Osman. Ottoman succession law dictated that any of the sultan's sons could claim the throne after his death, not just the eldest. But multiple sons meant multiple factions who could fight for their own candidate, even to the point of civil war. In previous generations, the heir who managed to take hold of the throne would quickly eliminate his brothers as threats by having them murdered. Ahmed I's father, Mahmed III, had ordered the strangling of all 19 of his younger brothers, horrifying and infuriating the people. But Qasim loved all five of her sons and didn't want to see four of them killed. She spoke against the princely bloodbaths of the past. While ensuring the prominence of her own Murad, she also advocated for and even befriended her husband's other sons and her brother-in-law, Mustafa. She believed that turning them into allies rather than enemies might better suit her ambitions and protect her own sons from death. Sultan Ahmed died at 27 of typhus. As all of his sons were still children, the court was thrown into turmoil over who should be the next sultan. 
Qasim's own son, Murad, was only five years old and was considered far too young to take the throne. The court was divided into factions favoring two rivals, Ahmed's brother, 26-year-old Mustafa, and his eldest son, 14-year-old Osman. Qasim had wisely forged friendships with both contenders, thus protecting her own sons. She favored Mustafa because she felt that she could better control him. There were serious concerns about his mental health. He didn't want to become sultan and even tried to escape the palace. But Qasim advocated for him nonetheless. Far better, she thought, to have a weak sultan under her thumb until her own son was old enough to rule, than a young, strong sultan who might keep the throne and never give Murad a chance. Prince Osman's own mother had died when he was young, so he didn't have a powerful woman in the harem to advocate for him. Qasim made an agreement with members of the council, and Mustafa was named Sultan. During his reign, his mother, Halima Sultan, returned from the Palace of Tears to which she had been exiled, and became Valid Sultan. Because of the Sultan's poor mental health, she acted as his regent. Mustafa was unstable. He was unable to pay attention during council meetings, removed his turban, and pulled on his beard. He was often observed sitting in the garden, staring blankly, or throwing coins at birds and fish. It was clear to all that he was mentally and emotionally disturbed. Only 96 days after his appointment, Mustafa's detractors organized a coup against him, and he was deposed in favor of his nephew, Osman II. Before her death, his mother had ensured that he received an outstanding education, and though he was only 14, he was an intelligent and insightful ruler. He secured the empire's eastern border and then marched west to invade Poland. But this campaign was a failure, largely due to the lack of discipline within his personal army, the Janissaries. He punished the Janissaries by lowering their pay and closing their coffee houses. He then announced that he would be going on a pilgrimage to Mecca, but his real intent was to recruit a new army in Egypt and Syria and overthrow the Janissaries. Already displeased and suffering severe caffeine withdrawal, the Janissaries learned of Osman's plan to replace them. So a group of them stole into Osman's bedroom and strangled him, ending his reign after only three years. He was 17. Mustafa was once again placed on the throne, but his second reign only lasted a year. During Mustafa and Osman's reigns, Qasim lived at the Palace of Tears, keeping her sons close and biding her time. Once her own son Murad reached the age of 11 and was considered old enough to take the throne, she returned to the capital. Mustafa's mother, Halim Sultan, had little choice but to agree with Qasim's demand that her son be deposed. But she pled that his life be spared, and instead of being strangled, the former sultan was allowed to live out the rest of his life in the kafas or cage, a luxurious prison used to house and control the male relatives of sultans, as an alternative to death. Halima Sultan retired and lived out the rest of her life at the Itziki Palace, called the Palace of Tears, the home of concubines of dead sultans. Qasim's son, Murad IV, was named Sultan. As queen mother, Qasim ran the empire through her son. She attended cabinet meetings but still had to keep up appearances, so she hid behind a screen. But as Murad grew, he repeatedly attempted to exert his own power. His mother tried to distract him with gifts of beautiful women, ornately dressed horses, and lavish banquets. But once he turned 20 and no longer needed a regent, he removed his mother from power and threatened to banish her if she continued to meddle in politics. But headstrong Murad lacked his mother's experience and expertise. Without her steady hand at the helm, the empire quickly fell into anarchy. 
the Safavid Empire invaded Iraq, northern Anatolia revolted, and the Janissaries stormed the palace and killed the Grand Vizier, among others. Despite him pushing her aside, Qasim continued to support and protect her son. When she learned of a plot among religious leaders to overthrow him, she warned him and he was able to evade disaster and put the men responsible to death. Murad recaptured Baghdad and Qasim threw celebrations upon his triumphal return, making her son the hero of the day, but also displaying her own prominence by riding in a golden carriage. But Murad committed one betrayal that Qasim could not forgive. He ordered the executions of his younger brothers. Qasim begged him to spare his brother Ibrahim, arguing that as he was mentally disabled, he could never pose a real threat. Murad agreed for a time, but in 1640 he issued an order for the death of Ibrahim. Before the execution could be carried out, Murad himself suddenly died at the age of 27. Some suspected Qasim of having her son poisoned. Though Murad had fathered ten sons with his concubines, they had all died in childhood, and not one of them could succeed him. So the throne went to the only Ottoman male left alive, Ibrahim. When the Grand Vizier came to the Kafis to inform the young man that he was now Sultan, he refused to believe it. He was terrified that his brother was trying to trick him and that he would be strangled. Only when his mother showed him his brother's corpse did he agree to leave the cage. Sultan Ibrahim came to be known as the Mad. His diagnosis is not clear, but his condition was surely exacerbated by the trauma of his brother's murders and growing up under constant threat of death. He had no interest in or patience for governing, but with battles being lost and revolts popping up across the empire, a strong leader was desperately needed, and that leader was Qasem. She represented continuity as sultans and grand viziers came and went, and she continued to hold the empire together. But there was one crucial thing that only Ibrahim could do, father and heir to the throne. Unfortunately, he was impotent, and it was feared that his death would spell the downfall of the empire. Qasem ordered doctors and midwives to prescribe a number of different potency-enhancing tonics from the Islamic Books of Love. She sent dozens of beautiful concubines to entertain him, and finally, he was cured. His first son, Mahmed, was born when the Sultan was 27, and the empire collectively sighed with relief and rejoiced at the birth of the heir. His mother, Turhan, hailed from Russia. She also bore a daughter, but was otherwise largely ignored by Ibrahim. Now freed from his impotence, the Sultan went sex mad. He spent all of his time in the harem with his concubines, often running naked through the palace gardens with them and riding around on their backs as though they were mares. He emptied the treasury to lavish his favorites with gifts. He was particularly attracted to overweight women and demanded that the fattest woman in Istanbul be brought to him. He called her Sugar Cube and spent hours lounging with her and feeding her sweet delicacies. He dressed extravagantly, hung diamonds from his beard, and often donned flowers in his hair instead of his imperial turban, much to the horror of the court. He was obsessed with fur and covered entire rooms in the palace top to bottom with expensive lynx and sable. The French ambassador dubbed him Le Fou de Fourreur, the fur madman. He even shaved the palace cats and made them wear sable capes. In order to fund his mania, Ibrahim introduced taxes on his ministers and governors, angering them. But in addition to his whimsy, the Sultan was also abusive and cruel. 
he humiliated his sisters by ordering them to serve his concubines, perverting the long-established hierarchy of women. Ibrahim took a liking to the infant son of a servant and wanted to make this unrelated child his heir instead of his own son, Mahmed. When Mahmed's mother, Turhan, complained, Ibrahim flew into a rage, ripped her child from her arms, and threw him into a pool. Prince Mahmed would have drowned, but he was rescued by a servant. He was left with a permanent scar on his arm. When Ibrahim heard a rumor that one of his concubines was having an affair with someone outside the harem, he was infuriated and interrogated the women. But as he could not determine who was being unfaithful, he ordered 278 of his concubines to be drowned in the Bosphorus Strait. The Sultan's behavior had gone too far. Qasim and the Grand Vizier plotted to depose him. Ibrahim was informed of the plot and had the Vizier executed and his mother banished from the palace. In the chaos, the Venetian navy was closing in on Istanbul, and there was starvation in the capital. The Janissaries turned on the Sultan, and with their support, the new Grand Vizier finally had the power to remove Ibrahim. Qasem gave her consent to the plan, writing to the Grand Vizier, In the end, he will leave neither you nor me alive. We will lose control of the government. The whole society is in ruins. Have him removed from the throne immediately. Sultan Ibrahim was seized and imprisoned. A few nights later, his lifelong fear came true. He was strangled with a bowstring. His seven-year-old son, Mahmed IV, was now placed on the throne. Qasem presented her grandson to the viziers and said, Here he is, now see what you can do with him. She refused to send the young sultan to the mosque to be crowned. Instead, she insisted that the ceremony take place in the palace, where she could keep him safe. She was now regent to a third sultan. The position should have gone to Mahmed's own mother, Turhan, but she was overlooked because of her youth and inexperience. But Turhan soon gained support. Within three years, she was a rival to Qasem and wanted to take her proper place as queen mother and regent. Qasem refused to relinquish power and retire to the Palace of Tears. A tug of war commenced between the two women with young Mahmed in the middle. The Sultan did as his mother and grandmother told him. Often they would whisper to him from behind a screen during council meetings. In one instance, an ambassador recorded the child Sultan turning to the screen and asking, what answer should I give? With Turhan growing in power, Qasem began to plot to overthrow Mahmed and replace him with another of her grandsons, one whose mother was weaker and more malleable. Qasem asked the guards to leave the palace gates open so that her Janissary supporters could sneak in and kill Turhan while she slept. She also gave two bottles of poisoned sherbet to the head sweet maker in the palace kitchens and promised her a promotion if she would serve the deadly delicacies to the child sultan. But one of Qasem's servants betrayed the plot to Turhan. That very night, Turhan ordered her own supporters to find the queen grandmother and kill her. Qasem hid in her rooms behind 300 guards, but the assassins cut her chief guard to pieces and forced their way into her apartment. A loyal servant tried to protect Qasem by yelling, I am the queen mother, but they were not fooled. Qasem was found hiding in a cupboard. The hem of her dress protruded under the door and gave her away. She was strangled with a cord from a curtain and struggled so much that blood spurted out of her ears and nose. Her life and her 28 years in power were brought to an end. 
the assassins looted her rooms and stole diamonds and rubies the size of chestnuts. Twenty chests brimming with gold were found in her apartments. The public was saddened by the assassination of the popular queen mother, who, in an open secret, had been the real power in the empire for much of their lives. Three days of mourning were declared, during which mosques and bazaars were closed. In the aftermath, hundreds of Qasim's supporters were also executed to secure the power of Sultan Mahmed and his mother, Torhan. The new queen mother ruled as regent for five years. She continued to whisper orders to her son from behind a screen. But her regency was troubled by further war with Venice and a financial crisis which resulted from the high cost of the conflict. Once Mahmed came of age, Turhan willingly stepped aside and allowed him to rule on his own. She died in 1683 at the age of 55. After Turhan Sultan, the Sultanate of Women came to an end. Hundreds more women were taken into the harem over the following centuries and gave birth to sultans. But no consort or queen mother would ever attain the heights of power achieved by Horem, Norbanu, Safiya, and Qasem. The century during which women stepped in to run the empire while their spouses and sons were incapable was a time of great turmoil. Historians have often blamed these women for the many problems in the empire when it was they who were holding things together and under the considerable limitations of the harem system. The Sultanate of Women has long been seen as the beginning of the end of the Ottoman Empire. But the empire continued on for another 239 years and didn't come to an end until 1922. Now, the Sultanate of Women is being reconsidered for its many achievements. The building of monumental mosques and public works and the end of the practice of fratricide. It is seen as a time during which the Ottoman Empire reached its height. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.